Well, if you've taken the, what you don't want to do is take, here's, this is reasonable advice too, I think. Where the problem area lies, people think it lies in taking too much. It lies in taking too little. Because if you take too little, you can resist it. You can struggle with it. And then it can turn into a real mess because you're afraid of it. And you actually have the power to some degree to resist it. What you want to do is take sufficiently enough that there's no escape and that the transition from ordinary reality to fully loaded is as quick as possible because the going up is somewhat terrifying. For example, let's use psilocybin as the model. Here's how it works for me. This is not tea. This is eating raw mushrooms. It comes on more slowly. So after an hour or so, you know, of, and the way I do it is I sit in, after, as soon as the mushroom enters my body, I sit and meditate. Uh, I noticed in South America they don't do it like this. They dose the ayahuasca, and then everybody just goes on talking about their motorcycles and the jobs at the sawmill and uh, who's conning. Who. It's like totally, they toss it. There's a brief moment. They pour, they toss it down, then they all go back to raving at each other about mundane life. And then 30 minutes later, on the dot, the shaman blows his whistle or shakes his shakyapa, his leaf, uh, dry leaf bouquet, and everybody settles down and it's like it comes on within two minutes. As soon as the guy starts singing, he just invokes it. The way I do it is I, uh, I take the mushroom or the ayahuasca, and then I sit and I roll bombers, uh, so I'll have them ready if I need them, and then and I just sit as I'm going to sit during the trip, and I've unplugged the telephone, and I've uh, gotten everything squared away, and it begins to come on at about the 40-minute or the 60-minute mark, and as and it's, there's sometimes some nausea as it comes on. And then I smoke a bomber, or half a bomber. I, and, then, and then it catapults it into the full deployment of the thing, where you just hang on. There's about a 25-minute period where all your only job is to, is to hang on. It builds. It's like watching an atomic explosion on the other side of 50 feet of absolutely clear crystal glass. I mean, you can't believe this is happening, quote unquote, in my mind. You have the feeling that everybody from Seattle to San Diego is just crawled under their desk as this thing tore past, but it's in your mind. And then, uh, then there is the interaction with it, which moment to moment, you are pretty coherent, but you lose it. it. A lot of it does not transcribe into short-term memory. And then after about an hour or 40 minutes of that, it becomes more manageable, more memorable. Uh, the most mind-boggling parts of it are just not possible to bring out of it because language fails. Because English, there are no words. There are no words even close. I mean, sometimes you'll bring out an image or a metaphor, but out of five hours of tripping, you bring out, you know, half a notebook page of metaphors, and yet you were entirely engaged during that time. Now, this question about fear, which is a real question, because when everything begins to slide, if you are not, if it's, it's, it's more than most people who haven't done it expect, they have heard it, they've read the books, they, they, but they think it's a metaphor. They don't understand it's really going to happen and it's really going to happen to you. And there's a tendency to clutch or to try and resist it. The thing to do in those situations, I think, and it's counterintuitive to how Western people think, but the thing to do is to sing, to sit up, 
not to assume the fetal position. See, you, what you might tend to do is assume the fetal position and tell yourself, my God, this is the most appalling thing that's ever happened to me. If I can just live through it, it'll be all right. I've taken this drug. If I can just wait through. How long did they say it will be? Seven hours. Uh, I see it, it started two minutes ago. Uh, if I can just... No, the thing to do is to sit up and to sing. Why? Well, being practical people, to oxygenate your brain, to move this, the entire, this thing that's happened to you, though it may have one claw in heaven, its roots are in your neurophysiology and in the chemistry of the drug. You want to move your physiology around. So oxygenating your brain can't fail to do this. So you sing, and this almost always is accompanied by a sense of power, control, equilibrium, and uh, so forth and so on. Not always. I mean, let's face it, you're a product of a nutty society, and there are unexamined crevices and uncleaned out drain traps in all of us, and... uh, and you're going to encounter that stuff. The good news is the earlier psychedelic trips tend to deal with that. If You will quickly discover taking psychedelics that either you can work through your personal issues and become a psychedelic explorer, or this is just stronger medicine than you are up for, and you would be far better to go back to psychoanalysis or whatever works for you. Uh, some people just can't take it. Uh, why is that? Well, because what it does is it dissolves boundaries. And most of us are over boundary defined. But some of us are having an uphill battle getting some boundaries in place and realizing we are not the telephone or the tree or the person we live with. Uh, And so for those people who are having trouble establishing and maintaining boundaries, this is the last thing on earth they should get involved.